Welcome to Reason for Truth. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo. Welcome back to another episode of Reason for Truth. Today, I want to talk to you about spiritual U-turns. We'll be looking at Psalm 51. Listen, all of us fall short in sin daily when we begin to drift from God's Word. And it's staying out of prayer and really out of His presence. And pretty soon we find that we mentally, spiritually, and sometimes even physically begin to feel the world's sin upon our soul. The good news is that it's never too late. Because, listen, God always allows spiritual U-terms. Welcome to Reason for Truth, where the truth comes first and the reasons come last, but where we're always and constantly learning, because when we stop learning, we stop teaching, or at least stop teaching well. Today's truth is that our sin eventually invokes God's discipline upon our lives, leading to the withdrawal of His joy, His hand of blessing, and provision in our life. The good news is that it's never, again, I'm going to repeat that, it's never too late for us to repent get close and get right with God, make a spiritual U-turn back towards God. Today I'm going to show you four simple steps, really from King David's Psalm 51, that'll help you make a spiritual U-turn. As stated in last week's episode, God's sin quota is very real. It's a sin quota, you can go back and watch that episode, is uh, it's an imposed sin restriction that limits the amount of unrepentant sin God allows us to master in a particular period of time before he brings his discipline upon our lives, namely by withdrawing his joy, his hand of blessing and provision, again, as I just said, in our lives. The good news, again, is that we serve a gracious God. He's patient, he's loving, but he's also just, you know. God's just, and it's never too late, again, to repent because he'll accept us back each and every time. If we're authentic, if we abuse that, I think he's going to perhaps bring judgment in greater force to, so that we begin to learn. Now, King David tells us this in Psalm 51, whereby he provides us a biblical blueprint for making a U-turn with God. Furthermore, God shows us through David that no matter how bad we've sinned, it's never too late, never too late to repent and make a spiritual U-turn from our sin back towards God. Most of you have seen some of our other episodes on David Berkowitz. David is a godly man. He was a serial killer, one of the most famous in U.S. history. His name was Son of Sam. You can Google that. Solid believer now. He's ministering in um, maximum security prison in New York. David was, uh, listen, a mass murder. But now he's repentant and uh, he's never taken. He made a massive U turn and God has welcomed him in. Is he free on the streets? No, there's consequences to that. But David still, nonetheless, is free in Christ, right? His identity is in Christ. Now, in Psalm 51 18, King David, not David Berkowitz, King David prays for Jerusalem regarding his own really disgraceful, adulterous, and murderous actions against member Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. Uh, David's lust-filled abuse of power led to his disgraceful conduct, which, listen, had serious implications, not only for himself, not only for Bathsheba and Uriah, who was, he murdered, but also for Israel's security, had he not repented. In other words, the entire nation of Israel would be punished by God for their sins, the sins of their leader, King David, if he didn't repent, get right with God and make a spiritual U-turn. This is true for any nation, by the way, whose leaders la you know, lack godly wisdom and actions and act wickedly. They risk their entire nation to be judged by God. That's a sobering thought for the entire world. Proverbs 14.34 tells us this, says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to anyone or to any people. Okay. In Joshua 7, 5, because of, if remember, Achan's personal sin, all of the children of Israel suffered a defeat in battle as a result of his sin. Achan's actions resulted in the Israelites actually being collectively punished by God and that they failed in their first attempt to capture the city of Ai. Okay. When Achan sinned in the days of Israel's conquest of Canaan, the army of Israel could not conquer this teeny, tiny, weeny little town called I, it's A-I, until Achan's sin was judged. It ought to have been a very easy and quick battle for them to win, by the way. But it just shows you, nothing's a done deal until it's a done deal, right? When God's not with you, no deal's a done deal. But God's judgment's not to be contended with, right? One man's sin, in this case Achan, he had destroyed the nation's effectiveness militarily. You can read about that for yourself in Joshua uh, chapter 7. Now, going back to Psalm 51, verse 18, David refers to Jerusalem's walls uh, in this verse. He asks God to build up the city's walls as it... Why do you build up a city's walls? For protection, as it seems David was in the process of repairing and building the city's walls. 
and he longed for this successful completion of the project. Now, David lapsed in his responsibilities, though, obviously, read about that. Perhaps David's sins with Bathsheba, I don't know, and the murder of her husband Uriah distracted him from the task of rebuilding that wall, and perhaps other sins, having all those wives and concubines. Now, that would leave and did leave Jerusalem vulnerable for attacks. David's son Solomon went on to build the temple, okay? It had to be in place. First Kings 3.1 tells us that it was King Solomon, who, again, David's son, who finished the building. The walls around Jerusalem making the city secure. God wouldn't allow it for David. Now, when you and I sin, God's hand of blessing, his power, his provision, and walls, like that wall, the wall of protection God places around us, begins to re, you know, retract and draw down. The same is true for our nation and all nations. Listen, I found this to be true in my own life first before I preach it to you or anybody, and I'd assert that it's true in your life, as it is mine, and every authentic follower of Jesus Christ, you know, to be true. The good news is that it's never too late to make a spiritual U-turn and avoid God's judgment. A good way that you can do this is through the five simple steps as follows. I'm going to give you five. I hope you'll take these, write them down, go back and watch the video and write them down first. We need to, uh, you need to acknowledge the sins you've committed. That's number one. Second, you need to confess. You must confess a sin before God. Third, you must ask God's forgiveness. Fourth, you must turn away from your sin. And fifth and lastly, you must restore the wrong, if you're able to, with right. Okay, to summarize, to repent, you need to confess your sins to the Lord, then seek forgiveness for those who have wronged you, restore in as much as you possibly can the damage from your actions or perhaps your words. Now, as you strive to repent, seek wisdom from your spouse, your parents, godly friends, your pastor. Most importantly, seek God's wisdom through his word and certainly the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Writer Lily Dunbar in uh, Fuel for a Wildfire Faith, that's a website, wrote how to make a spiritual U-turn and said that making a spiritual U-turn must be intentional. I like that. Lily's spot on. Lily tells a story of waking up when one morning, I think we could all relate to this. She's, uh, you know, got to go to work, and she's in a mental fog, and she ends up in this this turn lane, and in a, just a mental fog, and she's completely stuck at this long light, and there's tons of traffic. Turns out, I think it was, if I read the article correctly, it really was the wrong lane in the first place, and she asked herself, how did I, how did I get stuck in this traffic? How did I get in this place? How did I get in this wrong turn direction? And then, listen. How did I get into the wrong lane is what she asked in the first place. You see, she discovered that she was so tired and in a mental fog that she simply followed the car that was directly in front of her without thinking about what she was doing or where she was going. She followed up her story with being stuck in this traffic light and connects that story with how to make a spiritual U-turn. And that's going to be kind of be used throughout these five different uh, steps for repentance and making a U-turn. I'm going to go over them again. First, she says that like her car signal light, that you must signal to stop and ask God to wake you up, help you hit a red light in your soul when you're heading in the wrong direction. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 to 34 says this, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor. That's the key there, not a mental fault. As is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this in your shame. Interesting. We must be sensitive to the presence of God, folks, and to the warning and direction of the Holy Spirit, who's going to prod us when we sin, giving us some, you know, cues there. Hey, you're sinning, turn, make a U-turn before you really have to make a U-turn and you can, you've incurred some damage there. So if we keep close accounts with God, those U-turns are, you really may not even need to make a U-turn. may just say, hey, this is not looking good, but I'm going to make a teeny little turn instead of a wide U-turn when I've got more to deal with. Keep, keep close accounts with God through His Word, through prayer. Be sensitive. You will automatically, by doing closer to being closer with God, you're going to be sensitive to your sin because the Holy Spirit's going to prod you, right, in your soul hey, and tell you, hey, this is not right. You're going to sense it. You're going to know it. You see, when we stray from God, the Holy Spirit will prod us to make a spiritual U-turn. But we won't know that if we're not keeping close accounts with God. The further we get from God, the more tolerant of our sins we become ourselves, continuing further down the wrong road away from God. And the Apostle Paul makes clear that we are not to continue down the wrong road to sin. And he's very clear. There's no excuse for this because unlike others who have little, if any, knowledge of God or the Bible, we as mature Christians in Christ 
do. We're going to be held accountable for that. That's number one, right? You got to be sensitive to the to God. Make sure that you, you're not in this fog and that you're sensitive. Being close to the Lord so the Holy Spirit will prod you in, in the word for wisdom and knowledge. Second, when we make spiritual U-term, we need to slow down and yield. See, life's not a competitive NASCAR race, Lily writes. Put on your brakes and pull out the Holy Road manual, she says. It's okay if you let people whiz by you for a while and, you know, tune into your GPS. Listen, your spirit, Lily says, is the key there. Keep close accounts with God. James 3, verses 13 to 17 says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I would assert that the United States of America, first and foremost, needs to go back and reread those words because that is not happening here. It's not happening, period. Now, the question at the opening of this verse, verse 13, which sets the theme for the entire passage, asks the question as to who is wise and understanding among you. It's a good question. The answer is the person who remembers his moral responsibilities. That person needs to be you and I and uh, and. That, listen, so that's saying it's pertaining to us. Now, step three is making in making a spiritual U-turn is, listen, we got to turn against the flow of traffic, right? Like a uh, little driving down in traffic. Sometimes you got to just go against, listen, where everybody's going, don't follow that car in front of you just because they're going that way. That's being a follower. You want to be a leader. All Christians are leaders because we follow the ultimate leader and you quite often going against the culture, counterculture. Now, everyone on the road is heading where you are going, and some drivers are, listen, they're on a dead-end highway. That's just period. That's, you don't have to, listen, be careful who you follow. A sharp turn in the opposite direction of oncoming traffic will require you to be brave. Don't hesitate. Just as Carrie Underwood sings, ask Jesus to take the wheel. If you need a little extra help going against the cultural flow of traffic, listen, that'll lead you, that's going to lead you to some grief. It is. Going against culture is going to lead you to some grief in the very short term. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 10 says this, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, Paul is saying, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while, as it is. I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt the godly grief. So that, and that's the Holy Spirit, by the way, right? You felt the godly grief. That's the Holy Spirit prodding their conscience. So, you, for you felt the godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 10. See, when you grieve in the world without Christ everything's dead. It's dead here, and it's dead for eternity. When you're in Christ, everything's alive in eternity. And even if you grieve for a little while in your flesh, God will make good eventually pull you out of that, no matter what situation you're at, okay? The bottom line for step three is that making a spiritual U-turn means turning against a cultural flow of traffic that will, you know, entail some level of grief and some pain and perhaps persecution in your life. That might be grief from your friends, might come from your friends, possibly from members, even of your family. And today we're seeing a lot of that today, or your co-workers. But remember Paul's words, that it's only for what? A little while. Fourth and lastly, the final step is to keep your eyes on the road. Don't get distracted by, you know, listen, keep moving forward on the road God has set before you. God tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 to 27, to keep your heart with all vigilance. And from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech. Put devious talk from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all of your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Verse 23 uses the word heart, meaning the mind or the, the inner being, the springs of life. Literally speaking of the outgoings of life and your spirit, right? The actions of your, your whole self. 
coming through the physical. You're driving the car that's coming from your innermost spiritual soul, okay? Uses the word as well when it talks about your spiritual vitality, right? That's key here. Now, verse 27 tells us, do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. This is very important, Proverbs 427. Now, this section demands consistency of heart and purpose, honesty and speech and steadfastness, setting off on a path, folks, of wisdom. That's not casual thing, right? This emphasizes virtue. It prepares us really with a very frightening warning that comes in chapter five. This is a four, chapter four is a preparation chapter for chapter five, which is very frightening. The bottom line is that the son must also keep his eyes, his attention fixed on the right path and off the wrong path. He must maintain a tunnel vision, not allowing his focus to be distracted by evil from what is straight in front of him. Verse 25. Listen, you and I, much the same, must keep our feet on the path of life. Verse 26. Rather than turn off that path onto the way of evil. Verse 27. Taken together, these admonitions are a reminder once again that walking in wisdom entails a lifetime of work. Not a single decision, but really fighting these spiritual battles daily. They're like little battles in light of the entire war, which takes you into eternity. Listen, that we'll never have to visit again in the future. God doesn't allow us a single U-turn, by the way. If we're authentic believers in Jesus Christ and we're authentic in our repentance, we're going to sin daily. We need to keep short accounts with God. God allows us repeated U-turns, as long as we're being, we're not abusing that and we're authentic and asking God. For If you ask un, you know, authentically and you're not going to really make any effort to be a little better next time or to make a U-turn, period, God's not going to honor that. Lily closes by saying that no matter how long you've traveled on the wrong direction, you can always turn around. The light of His grace will always signal the way. Well said, Lily. Liz, next Tuesday, I'm going to give you eight important essential things I think that are going to really mine down a little more deeply in terms of an authentic and effective repentance in making a U-turn. And uh, make sure you subscribe. You subscribe, man. Bam, hit that little alert bell down there. I tell you, Sicilian list hook. Left hook, you're not going to miss anything. You're not going to miss that episode. This Thursday, though, coming up in two days, I'm going to share with you something a little bit different. Have something else in mind. Listen, please leave your comments below. I promise I'll respond to you within a very, very reasonable amount of time. If you're listening on one of our podcast platforms and we're on all just about all the major ones, please consider a five-star review, by the way, and iTunes. We'd appreciate that. Share it with others. You want to make certain that you check out our new online training academy, equippedacademy.com. You can also go there at reasonfortruth.org and just hit the Equipped Academy tab. There you can find resource tab and video training tab. Ah, easy as that. Anyways, appreciate you taking a look at that. It's uh, offering some more in-depth training there. If you're watching on YouTube, on the other hand, you want to make sure you know what I always say, man, you just go ahead and subscribe. You know that. And then you take, what is it? That left Sicilian hook. Bam! Well, if you're right hand, you can use right hand. I don't care. Listen, just smash that little alert bell. It's not, remember what I say. It's not a clock. It's a bell. Subscribe, alert bell. Man, you're going to be tuned in every time a new episode comes out. Just smash that thing. Make sure you tune in next week. Yeah, I think you're going to enjoy it. And make sure you tune in on Thursday. You can see what I have in mind. Something more light from the heart. Until next time, I'll see you for the next episode. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo. This is your Reason for Truth for today.